I have to tell you, uh, my name is Tom Workman. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is uh, at Dr. Workman, but I'm really representing the uh, American Institutes for Research, where I work, uh, Center for Patient and Consumer Engagement at AIRCPCE. Um, and so I'm so excited to be here, but I, I have to tell you, I, I'm so uh, engaged in the stories and in everyone else's presentation that I literally just a second ago had to stop and go, what am I talking about? What am I here for? I knew I'm here for something and I couldn't remember what it was. Uh, but now I do remember, so luckily we'll be able to talk for the next few minutes. Um, I had the great privilege, I've had the great privilege of working with ARC for quite some time, assisting the Eisenberg Center, which is the translation unit for the effective healthcare program. And basically what that means is we've been able to translate and disseminate uh, evidence-based outcomes information to patients, to clinicians, to policymakers, and that sort of thing. And now that I'm at AIR, um, I had the great privilege in the last nine months to uh, help them understand this new phenomenon of patient-powered research networks. But Corey recently published a paper on it as well, and ARC has now published a paper on it that I authored, and uh, is available to you if you go to effectivehealthcare.arc.gov, as are quite a number of other resources. I uh, am only going to read one very, very short line that I want to make sure I get correct from the actual paper. All, if you pick up the slides, I actually put excerpts from the paper in it, but I'm going to ignore all of that and tell you uh, what I really learned. And what I really learned came from meeting some incredibly brave, incredibly impactful, uh, in, incredible human beings who took their individual health issues and created ways to extend research in ways they have never been extended before. And so I'm delighted to share their stories. And, and this is really uh, about their stories. So. Um, to get started, I, I, perhaps you saw in 2002 this Time magazine cover, and it's amazing how in our conversations the last two days, we still see a lot of this existing. So our concept of patient engagement in research still remains very much like what this picture depicts. The patient is the subject. The patient is the guinea pig, perhaps. In fact, what's fascinating is we've interviewed thousands of patients about what research means, most patients think that when their doctor tries a medicine, that's research. And they have no idea how often that data is never considered and certainly not put into aggregate to understand the population. So many patients feel like they are disconnected from research. Most importantly, they feel like they're disconnected from research because even when their own data is used, they don't ever get to see the results of that data. In fact, as we heard about open access problems, it's probably in some academic journal that they could never access or they'd have to pay to access, and probably once they accessed, couldn't read. Wouldn't make any sense to them as they read it. So um, this sort of common issue is that I feel like I'm so disconnected from research and I have to rely upon a completely different set of people who are going to decide what questions are going to be asked and they're going to decide what answers are going to be given. The second and probably more pressing problem, and what really has driven the patient-powered research network movement, has been the pure lack of information that exists, especially for patients who have a, a type of rare disease. Right? Cystic fibrosis is a brilliant example of that, and we have quite a few examples like that. So that as individuals like Pat Furlong, an RN whose child has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and is told by her doctor, we have no idea what to tell you. There's no information, there's no research, there's no anything for you. Good luck. We don't know how to treat it. We don't even know how to tell you what to expect. Good luck. We just don't know. Nobody's researching it. Go to the Muscular Dystrophy Association, who's looking at a variety of types of muscular dystrophy, and Patricia did that. She went to the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and they couldn't tell her very much. They didn't have a lot to offer her. That scenario happens on a regular basis for a majority of patients who say, and as you've heard over the last two days, I have data. I have medical records. I have my blood. I have my genes. Take them. Take a look at them. I have some data you could use to learn about this. How do I get you to take it and to learn from it? And that's really the genesis 
of how we came up with patient-powered patient registries and their newest, latest evolution, patient-powered research networks. I'm going to try to define both of these for you because they really are in evolutionary step and sequence, right? So what we know as a patient registry became a patient-powered registry, and what we know about all of that has become patient-powered research networks. Most of us here are all familiar with patient registries. These have been around for a while. So this is where we take a collection of individuals who share a common condition or a set of characteristics, and we start to track and collect in some standardized fashion information about those. It could be clinical information. It could be specialized questionnaire responses. It could be a variety of things. It could be tissue samples. could be blood samples. could be a variety of things that we gather together in this registry in some kind of systematic or standardized format that we use for one or more research purposes. Some registries are used, for example, for, to, um, to recruit people into clinical trials. Others are used for a variety of research questions and, um, or for a different variety of research agendas. Many of them are for a single or related group of conditions. And now we have a newer form of patient uh, registry which again is part of the hybrid that moves us to patient research networks of something called an agnostic registry. But most registries began non-agnostic. They were very, very devoted to a specific cause, such as Duchenne. So um, what changes when this becomes patient-powered? In other words, we have all kinds of researcher-driven, or as Pecori calls it, clinical data-centered uh, patient registries or, or research networks what happened was that now individual advocacy organizations decided they were going to create their own. We weren't going to wait for an NIH patient registry. We weren't going to have a patient registry that came from a hospital or came from a set of clinicians or from any set of researchers. We were going to start our own. We were going to create our very own. So the major difference when it becomes patient-powered is control that now we have control over the research agenda. Now we have control over the use of the data and the use of the findings. And that's been the most powerful impact of patient-powered patient registries. So this is what Patricia uh, Furlong created, Pat Furlong, one of my true heroes. I, I, I've just gained about 200 of them this weekend, but one of my heroes, certainly. Pat Furlong had a son who died of Duchenne's. He did actually pass away. Um, they didn't have the information they needed, but Patricia was uh, determined that she was going to make a difference. She searched throughout the world. She has wonderful stories. There's a brilliant New York, New York Times article about her, if you ever get a chance to read it. Uh, just, just Google, just Google, <laughs> just Google uh, Pat Furlong and you'll find it. Uh, she started the patient, the parent project muscular dystrophy. And that advocacy group was designed just to reach out to other parents of anyone who had Duchenne's to try to better understand the disease, to share information, and again, to advocate, as many of these organizations tried to do, to get the research community to research the disease. And so again, working with Muscular Dystrophy Association, working with a number of different organizations, they desperately tried to get research until finally Patricia said, forget it, we'll do it ourselves and created her own patient registry. This is patient-powered because Duchenne Connect, or the parent, the, page, the parent project, I always say that wrong, the muscular dystrophy controls everything about what this is. They recruit, they connect all the data, the data, they actually use the data, and then they bring it to researchers, or now researchers come to them. Patricia Furlong is now considered the world's leading expert in Duchenne's. And I think that's a phenomenal uh, impact that, uh, that teaches us volumes about all of this. From here, and again, hopefully you're hearing there's an evolution that, by the way, is really right in the midst of it. I think if I had to write this paper next year, it would be a completely different paper because this is all evolving so rapidly. One thing that people have started to recognize is that we have all these what we call standalone patient registries and there are limitations to what we can do when we just have a standalone registry. So some registries have started to build collectives where they've said, what if we standardized across a set of conditions? Again, thinking agnostically, what if we literally created a whole network 
of these standardized, and they could utilize the same infrastructure, and they could utilize, and I'm going to show you this is so important, the same standardization. What might that look like? What might that be? And the result has been pretty powerful so that we now have these patient-powered research networks. We do have a few patient or non-patient powered or clinical or researcher driven research networks, but very few. This really has been an evolution that was created by patients and created by the uh, patient powered uh, segment. So these share infrastructure, they have standardized data collection, and they're very, very powerful. In fact, several that I'm surprised aren't represented here, but certainly you're familiar with, are we're talking about. Probably the most famous one is patients like me. How many people have been on patients like me? Wow, really? That's amazing. Uh, patients like me is a, is, is a, a great story of how patient-powered research networks are created. In 2004, Stephen Haywood was diagnosed with a disease that, again, paid doctors said, don't know, can't tell you, so sorry. And so the Haywood family worked very, very hard to try and find answers, to try and see what they could do to save Stephen's life, to see what they could do to save others' lives. And the result of that was, unfortunately, ineffective. And so two of Stephen's brothers, as well as another fellow MIT graduate, started Patients Like Me. And started it, if you go online to Patients Like Me, you'll read, please read their openness creed, because it's brilliant, that their number one frustration was there was information out there they were not allowed to receive. They could not have access to, and they vowed to make a change about that. And so Patients Like Me, if you go on, has literally hundreds of communities across different diseases that you can join. I'm a diabetic, and so I'm in the diabetes group. And I can look at all the other diabetic type 2s just like me, and patients just like me, and I can literally sort of see how they're doing compared to how I'm doing. Whose A1C is bouncing like mine, whose isn't, right? Who's now using Victoza, and how are they doing, and compared to how am I doing? Right? All of those sorts of things are now possible, but that's happening over thousands of different uh, individuals, over hundreds of different conditions. The most important thing is we have access to that data. The last thing I want to tell you about patients like me, two things. One is that they're a for-profit organization, which has taken some controversy a little bit in the field. However, um, it's simply a new model and a different model. Um, but in the, in the patient-powered research network community, it, it's become a little controversial. But the thing that I like most about patients like me, ultimately, is that they've published their research. And some of their work, particularly around Stephen's uh, illness, has been published and has changed the face of what we know about that disease using purely patient-contributed information online. It's a whole new view of e-patients because now the e-patient becomes part of the researcher. Let me share another example, and actually a really powerful one. Another of my heroes is Sharon Terry. And if you're not familiar with Sharon Terry, Google her. She's a phenomenal woman who, uh, who started with two children who had a very rare disease, PXE, which is a rare form of genetic cancer. She started because, again, doctors told her, can't help you, don't know anything, can't tell you anything. PXC International. She reached out, literally, she and her husband, to every type of family she could find in the very small community of people with PXE. And she started to share information with one another, formed the advocacy organization, and eventually partnered with others, both large and small organizations and individuals, to form the Genetic Alliance and its main unit, which is the Genetic Alliance Registry and Biobank. Once again, using scientific advisors, using a repository system that they've literally raised funds to hire in order to provide this, individuals can share tissue samples, individuals can share blood samples, individuals can share all of their information, and, to do, and then ultimately, they've been able to publish a great amount of information about rare genetic disorders. Genetic Alliance has now moved to Reg for All, and I'll tell you quickly about the Reg for All story. Recently, Reg for All won the Sanofi Innovation Challenge. They were given $300,000 to assist 
Reg for All informing, and now you can join this. This is for every disease in the country, every disease in the world, frankly, and really allows patients to connect and register, all from the power of uh, Sharon Terry. Of course, there are essentials. Technology, recruitment is critical. Collaborative relationship with researchers is essential and with other stakeholders. And of course, there are some issues. If I create a standalone patient registry, patient powered or not, can I use the data collectively if it's standalone? And so standardization is a critical issue. Certainly, our competition for patients. Do I join patients like me? Do I join GARB? Which do I join? Do I join both? What does that do to our data? And how does that change the quality of our data? These are issues we still have to address as we move forward. A wonderful tool for people that I have to share with you is from Genetic Alliance. They actually have a toolbox to help people create both uh, patient registries as well as create um, parts of this research network. Sharon Terry believes that each individual registry needs to maintain its identity and that the network must have firm uh, collaboratives that allow individual identities so that PXC is still PXC for those who only care about PXC but it's part of a much broader network. And Sharon's now created the tools to help others do the exact same thing. This is the image we're after. This is a patient. This is a data provider. This is a researcher. And this is where we're moving in the future. Thanks.